before I will talk about the next I would like to thank the mouse. The mouse is a great a woman. Uh, she almost broken uh, her head in the last three years, so in 2015. So I, I have a patient with a serious disease. I will give a number of amounts to the patient. So they will contact her after three months. They will come to my clinic fully educated about serious disease and simple process like uh, kind of cooking and controlling their problem. So, uh, I can do this. So, the same disease. First, we will talk about the William Duck, who is the one who discovered the same disease. It's a Dutch pediatrician, uh, discovered during the food uh, shortage in the second uh, war. So, he noticed his patient has improved his diarrhea and external symptom after uh, the shortage of the food, after the second war finish. They resume back to the food and start to have their uh, symptoms. So he discovered uh, the celiac uh, disease. So uh, the prevalence of the celiac disease worldwide is, is considered as low. Uh, that was in 1995, but in the Western countries reached the one percent to the general population. But still, the celiac disease remains undiagnosed as worldwide. So what about the prevalence in our country? Uh, there are no doubt that about uh, the prevalence. So, uh, several study uh, reporting it's around from one person to the four person, which considers a very large uh, as, as number. And uh, this is a study done by Professor of uh, They selected 1,167 at the healthy student secondary school, and he uh, did a screening test based on the serology. So he found uh, the prevalence is around 2.2 percent. It's more in uh, al Qasim uh, area, which reach uh, 3.2 uh, percent. So again, here if you find uh, the prevalence of the celiac disease and a patient is meeting diagnosis criteria for uh, IBS. So if you have an IBS meeting the criteria, you should screen them for a celiac disease because the prevalence of the celiac disease reaching up to 5.4 percent if he has any diarrhea. So if he has a constipation, still there is a possibility of the celiac disease is reaching to the 1.5 uh, person. So international uh, recommendation now advising to screen all patients with an IBS uh, for a celiac disease. Here is a complex uh, slide uh, showing the pathogenesis of the celiac disease. We should understand this uh, slide because you know the future medication will be based on this uh, slide. So the first, uh, the gluten will reach the epithelial cell at the endocyte, will stimulate zonin protein, and that will allow increased intestinal parasitic intestinal permeability is allowing the gluten to go inside the lamina propria, which will activate. Uh, the dendritic cell in the presence of HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8 and this complex will call T, T cell activated releasing many cytokines will attract B cell which will release uh, the antibody in form of TTG that will later destroy the uh, epithelial cell and cause infamous uh, atrophy. So the pathogenesis is requiring uh, the presence of HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8 and also in the environmental factor in the form of the different virus which contribute to formation of the celiac disease and that then leading to the phagocytosis and intraepithelial lymphocytosis. So the manifestation of the celiac disease, uh, the common manifestation that the patient will be easy to be diagnosed if he presented with diarrhea, bloating, abdominal pain, and some patient will present with constipation, especially if he's a child with iron deficiency. There is a less a common or a typical presentation like uh, uh, hypo, uh, sorry, peripheral neuropathy, uh, taxia, or failure to thrive. Associated symptoms, you should keep to your mind if patient has diabetes type 1, if patient has a hypothyroidism, a microscopic colitis, or a rheumatological disease, or RG, IG nephropathy. So these are associated with the celiac disease. This is a dermatitis or It's commonly associated with uh, celiac disease with prevalence is 5%. Again, this is auditory body which is coming with an autosplenism. So, so uh, hypospenism. So, these patients, uh, they advise to uh, vaccinate for a pneumococcal vaccine. And especially if you did an ultrasound, you find this thin size is less than uh, 10 cc. 
So our problem with the sea lake disease is only we are discovering the top of the ice uh, iceberg, which is, is almost is considered is very very small uh, patient. Uh, the main problem we are facing is the sign of the sea lake disease and the, the latent sea lake disease, which is below uh, our uh, discovery. So uh, here is shown the diagram. If you're going to look for a typical uh, manifestation of the sea lake disease by the form of the malabsorption or more growth, you will discover only 0.5, 0.1 uh, percent. So if presentation, the classical presentation, the, uh, the preference is 0.1 uh, percent. Uh, patient uh, presented with active case finding, if you, if you do an uh, active case finding, you only discover uh, less than 0.5 percent. If you look for the high risk uh, growth, like patient uh, with uh, Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, type 1 diabetes, you will discover only 1% from them. Uh, but if you get to do a uh, mass screening, you will uh, discover 30% uh, of, uh, of these uh, patients. So the diagnosis of the disease, uh, when to do if the patient has a symptom or a symptomatic, uh, like a high risk patient, type 1 diabetes, Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, or other uh, disease which suggest uh, association with sea lake disease, you should consider uh, testing for them for sea lake disease. Uh, what are the diagnostic tests you should do? The preferred test is IgE anti tissue transmitted by nails. If IgE is normal, the sensitivity reaches to 95%, but the problem is that there is a deficiency in IgE, so it will be a negative. So if you think that your patient has an IgE deficiency, you should go for a uh, diamond glycine peptide. Alternative test is IgG uh, and DTTG uh, for a patient who has an Ig deficiency. So all the diagnostic surgical tests it should be done when your patient is taking routine. So if he's not, if he's a routine-free diet, it will be turned to be a negative. So this is uh, really what we are facing in our clinical practice. If you suspect the celiac and serology scale to be negative, you should keep in your mind uh, the age less than uh, two years. So in this kind of patient, you should request both as uh, IgA and IgA and tissue transmitted by uh, Other uh, possible color from the lab. And uh, you should uh, think about uh, if your patient has a negative serology, if he has a uh, selective IgA deficiency, or patient is on gluten-free diet, or if patient is uh, taking steroid or other immunity drug, or uh, he has a mystery of disease. So still, serology is not enough to diagnose the uh, CDF disease. You should go for endoscopy to confirm uh, the test. So the recommendation, you should take uh, four biopsies from the second and third portion of the duodenum, plus one to two from the duodenum bubble. Uh, surgical uh, criteria is based on the marsh or uh, scrolls are here. Is, uh, the left one short uh, normal focus, and the right one short anaphobus uh, atrophy. Still, we will use it as a marsh modified or corrosive. It's marsh classified from type uh, 1 uh, if there is intractive lymphocyte in type 2, if there is uh, crypt hyperplasia in type 3, if there is uh, fullness atrophy. So, this is very important to test as HLIQQ2 and HLIQQ8 when to use it. Usually, we are using this uh, as a negative predicted values to allow to see the disease if patient is taken. Uh, free diet. Other news for this uh, test, if you have an equifocal small bowel uh, histology finding uh, on the negative surgical uh, test, or if patient is taking as mentioned gluten free diet, so we should do this uh, test. So here we have an two option for screening. If you have a low probability or high probability, low probability, you should do only the surgical test. If positive, you go for uh, endoscopy to compare uh, by histopathology. If high probability test, you should go for both uh, serology and uh, endoscopy. Also, you should keep in your mind if you have uh, negative serology and a fibrous atrophy, you should not leave your patient uh, because here is best of differential diagnosis which can associate with the fibrous atrophy if uh, the serology is negative. So, so uh, the management of the celiac disease, as we know, it's a gluten-free diet. It's as simple to say as a gluten-free diet. Uh, so the patient should avoid uh, barely and dry. 
So, uh, and if you see diagnosed, you should look for spinal cord deficiency. So, at this level, it's easy to say to the patient, please go for a routine free time, but the patient will get uh, uh, suffering and struggling uh, uh, to be educated regarding this diet. So, uh, what are the problems related to the routine free diet? So, we know it's only the established therapy for patients with celiac disease. Uh, you know, it's a small piece of bread can cause significant inflammation of small uh, intestinal mucosa. So this is the problem of our patient. They can sometimes not compress to their gluten-free diet. So a treated celiac disease has increased risk of malignancy, uh, two to three fold uh, mortality also. So uh, uh, we understand the situation is only 50 to 60 patients from uh, patients with celiac disease are the good compare. So the remaining, they are not compared to the gluten-free diet. So we are suffering from this uh, kind of patient. So uh, there is also the high cost of dietary product. It's not all nations that can cover the expense of the gluten-free uh, diet product. Uh, our government, they are giving patients is, uh, almost as uh, 900 uh, Saudi riyal per month, which they call uh, 200 US a dollar per month, which still is not enough for them because their product is very expensive. Also, the MOH, they are supplying uh, some dietary product for, uh, for patients is, is a monthly, but this part that still we consider is not uh, enough. Uh, also, we are uh, facing the problem with algorithm because it's most critical age with very frequent transgression to the gluten-free diet. Another problem is asymptomatic acidic disease. It doesn't have a symptom, so he will not be uh, compared, uh, compared to his, his diet. Uh, this slide is showing uh, a celiac disease treatment burden. So if you uh, see, it's second to end stage uh, renal uh, disease. So the patient is suffering from dialysis three times a week. Our patient with celiac uh, disease, they are suffering just second to this uh, problem. So it's a really it's, it's a burden uh, disease for them. So what are factors associated with high protein uh, free diet treatment is burden. It's usually is eating, they need to eat from outside. Uh, they have they don't have a good uh, education and they are not complex to that and the other problem it's very high income their diet. So we should look for the alternative treatment for uh, gluten free diet. You know it's a gluten free diet is very good, but as a patient is really looking for the other uh, alternative management. So this is again is a complex slide showing the future a therapy for uh, celiac disease. There is a different step uh, intra aluminum which is trying to destroy the gluten from the small bowel or if they, or preventing the gluten to enter the epithelium and the next step preventing uh, the inflammation uh, cascade. We will talk about a uh, drug which will be nearly approved is varazotide. It's varazotide, it's uh, the role is parasitic inhibition through protein peptide through uh, trivitidium cell. So what are the mechanisms? It's blocking zonulin antagonist. So preventing is a parasitic permeability uh, of epithelium. Uh, so uh, the phase one trial is it's developed Find a classic control trial, it's done in 180 uh, for a patient. It was not much to the placebo or uh, larosotide, plus they give them 2.7 of gluten for a six week. So they, were, they uh, found there's no significant primary outcome, uh, uh, lamb ratio, but they found these patients taking larosotide, they removed their symptom. Also, reduction in serology. So, is, is a considered is very good drug right, to control the symptom of the patient and not improve it. So this is another uh, trial. Uh, they are including 347 symptomatic acidic disease on the protein free diet for 12 months. They want to see how this drug is working in patient with symptomatic or not. So they discovered a small dose 0.5 milligram induced significant decrease in both intestinal and extra intestinal. Uh, symptom of celiac uh, disease. There's another medication which is called Eximax 2. 
This is as it called as a vaccination for the celiac disease. It's a new medication. It's consumed as no peptide, but it's specific immunotherapy. It's a combination of three peptide as to reduce the new response to the patient with the celiac disease. And uh, it's need a patient to have an HLA to Q2.5, uh, which present is almost as 90% of the patient with the celiac disease. It's lead to reprogram for the T cell and will lead to sensitization. So it's administered by a uh, regular injection. This is the latest uh, uh, phase two, uh, sorry, phase one uh, trial, which I consider is well iterated and safe. Now there's a large and uh, international uh, phase two study in 20 Central and United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, 300 uh, patients with a protein challenge. The result is promising. It will be uh, released soon in September 2019. Other pharmacological therapy, it's all an enzyme that destroys gluten inside the intestine and then inside the human. It's a promising. It still is under control of the condition. And there is another uh, specific inhibition for transglutaminase in the intestine. It's also successful in the phase 2. The phase 2 is started by Folk uh, Pharma. So the patient with persistent symptom, despite a gluten-free diet, we should keep your mind, in your mind that maybe it's a correct diagnosis or as patient uh, not compliance to his medication or there is uh, existing a disease like microscopic colitis, bacterial overgrowth or IBS, bacterial intolerance, or it's a fracture which is a really major problem. So refractory disease, as we know, is divided into two types. Type 1 with a normal population of intraglutamine lymphocytes, and type 2 with uh, there is a pre malignant population. And the type 1 is considered as a good uh, prognosis, as a with mortality is less than 2% over the 5 years. At the type 2, the mortality is reached to the 5%, 50% uh, over the 5 years due to the malabsorption and severe malabsorption. So the treatment is only for the immune suppression, which has traditionally line uh, trichocortisone. So there's another complication, ulcerative gingitis. Uh, so you have to go to take an end core biopsy to about a T cell uh, lymphoma. So as uh, our conclusion, the prevalence is considered uh, as one person. It's a uh, low rate for diagnosis due to the very good presentation, so we should uh, screen your patient. It's only the effective and safe therapy for the celiac disease, gluten free diet. Uh, there is another uh, whole wing uh, medication to decrease uh, antigen load and proving uh, to uh, control uh, the gluten holiday or gluten symptom. The immune therapy can be indicated in the complicated celiac disease. There is hope for a future option uh, to treat.